All right. So now that we've kind of talked about some of the basics of XPS and AES, let's look at the instrumentation. And like I mentioned, there's a lot of common instrumentation between the two. All right. So like I said, these modern instruments can actually do both in a single chamber. Um, what we do need that is a little different for each is XPS. It's going to require an X-ray source. Um, and then AES, we're actually going to use an electron gun similar to SEMTEM. So we actually do have to have two different uh, sources here. Um, both require a common electron energy analyzer. Again, you know, we talked about wanting to determine the kinetic energy of electrons. And so that's going to be the same for either one. Uh, it's just that we're going to, to convert to binding energy for XPS. So this is a kind of a, a common um, schematic of both of these uh, happening. So you see an electron gun, an uh, X-ray gun. We also have some other components along the way. Uh, and then we have the, the multiplier and analyzer. But uh, for now, uh, you know, all I kind of want to mention out of this is that um, we can do it in the same chamber, but we do need uh, different sources. X-ray and electron. All right, so like I said, this can be in a single chamber and this has to be under extremely high vacuum levels. Uh, and we call this ultra high vacuum or UHV. So this is much higher compared to electron microscopy, particularly the SEM that we talked about. So for the ultra high vacuum that's required, uh, we're typically talking about 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 10 millibar, which is also roughly the same units as tor. So whatever units you want to use, uh, but here millibar or tor. Um, so again, that's very high, uh, higher than we're going to potentially see in uh, SEM and, and TEM. And the reason for this is the same reason that it's surface sensitive. Um, any gas molecules that are there will scatter the low energy electrons that we have. So we are trying to measure very low energy electrons and anything in its path will basically scatter or absorb. And so we have to be very cautious um, of that. Also, um, a surface can really quickly absorb um, gas molecules. Uh, a monolayer, so a very thin layer, within a second if we have 10 to the minus 6 millibar. So even a very high vacuum, we can absorb gas molecules onto a surface, and, and that will obviously affect the measurements that we get uh, with a surface-sensitive technique like these two. So we really need high vacuum. Um, so the other thing, so these vacuum chambers uh, tend to be, you know, as you can see over here, very shiny uh, because they are composed of uh, mostly stainless steel. So the majority of this is stainless steel. Uh, and then gaskets tend to be copper. Uh, and we do this because traditional sort of rubber or silicon uh, gaskets uh, would melt um, under the conditions we need uh, to heat up the chamber. And so typically, we're not gonna heat up the chamber during analysis, uh, but we do uh, do a process called baking, or uh, the chamber is baked. Uh, and what that does is we elevate the chamber uh, to about 250 or 350, and, uh, and we do that because it desorbs or removes the gas molecules from the walls of the chamber um, of the machine. So, you know, gas will eventually get to the, the chamber and we can do this baking or baking out sometimes is the terminology uh, to remove absorbed gas molecules from the, the chamber. So this is periodically done. Um, so typically what you'll see is that uh, there's either some type of heating element built in or a lot of times you'll just see like uh, uh, heating filaments kind of wrapped around the outside that heats it up. Um, and that just gives off the gas that's uh, absorbed onto the surface and allows us to have a heat, even higher vacuum um, afterwards. So that's why we have to use those copper gaskets as opposed to, to rubber um, and silicon and things like that. 
So to obtain um, these high, ultra high vacuum levels, um, we typically require very specialized uh, pumps. And a lot of times we have multiple pumps. Um, and so the ones that we kind of talk about here um, are turbo, turbo molecular, sputter ion, and diffusion pumps. So these give us a very high level of vacuum. And so these aren't the typical mechanical pumps that you're used to seeing on, uh, you know, maybe uh, other uh, much lower vacuum, like a vacuum chamber for um, drying off solvents and things. These are very expensive, uh, very high level vacuums. And um, they work on different principles, uh, but they give us a very high level. Uh, but here, we tend to focus on the two to the left, turbo molecular and sputter ion, uh, because there's uh, no risk of contamination with oil. Uh, so these tend to have uh, oil molecules um, like a mechanical pump. And so, um, you know, that causes contamination just like gas molecules would. So we try to go for these two on the, on the left. Uh, so I'm not going to talk too much in, in, in detail of these uh, different pumps, uh, of how they work and so forth, uh, but obviously there's a lot of information out there and you can find how these work. Uh, but oftentimes they'll be coupled and there'll be multiple stages of pumps that we have um, in a system. But again, we need these very sophisticated, uh, expensive <laughs> pumps to be able to reach these high vacuum levels. So this is a, a major component of the... Um, the XPS and AES. Um, again, the next thing we need is uh, an X-ray gun. We need a source of X-rays for XPS. Again, this is for X XPS. Um, here, though, um, in so this is going to be similar to XRD. Right? XRD also had to have an electron, an X-ray gun, and so in XRD, copper was a very common. Uh, source. However, for reasons we'll discuss in a, in a bit, um, XPS often uses aluminum or magnesium K-alpha radiation. And sometimes it's not even monochromatic, and so we'll talk about that as well. Um, so since we tend to use both of these, um, they um, often will have a kind of a switching mechanism so that we can use both. Uh, so in this case, this is kind of a sketch of an electron gun that allows kind of the switching between aluminum and uh, magnesium. So there's a couple different um, there's a couple different um, sources here in, in this case, but we have basically uh, two filaments uh, that you can see here, and we kind of switch between between the two. But again, we are using a slightly different source in aluminum magnesium compared to copper, which is very common for uh, major XRD or extra diffraction. All right. Um, so another thing uh, to use here, so why we use aluminum or magnesium is uh, they tend to have a lower energy. So what that does is uh, from, from this curve you see here, this is aluminum um, and the gun is at 15 kV and we see that the peak for the K-alpha is very narrow, narrow in energy. And so that narrow uh, peak, that line width, gives us higher resolution. And so basically the lower energy that we have gives us a narrow res uh, narrower line width and therefore that gives us higher resolution. So if we look at magnesium and aluminum, they both have pretty low energies if you compare that to copper, which has eight. So this is the reason we're using aluminum and magnesium is because of the much lower energy compared to copper. And that gives us better resolution. All right. So another component that we need is known as an ion gun. And this is used in both techniques for cleaning. So again, the surface, uh, you know, again, I, I mentioned that a monolayer of gas can accumulate, accumulate very quickly, absorb very quickly onto the surface. 
Um, we can also have other contaminants, um, such as absorbed hydrocarbons, water, oxide layers, anything like that, that can kind of cause issue with the surface that we want to look at. And so this ion gun uh, basically operates on the same principle as um, the sputtering that we saw with FIB, right? FIB um, uh, required uh, an ion gun to uh, remove a sample so that we could kind of cut away. Um, uh, and then the same thing with sputtering. Uh, it removed, uh, it used an ion uh, to bombard a material, get atoms and clusters, and then deposit it on a non-conductive sample. So it's really con uh, connected to fib and sputtering that we saw before. But this, the principle is really the same. So this is our specimen that we have here, and our surface is contaminated with hydrocarbons, water, or so forth. And so if we apply an ion, such as argon, um, and we hit the sample, uh, we will remove the top layer of that sample. And so we are able to remove very thin layers of the material or contaminates, uh, can contaminants on the surface. So an ion gun is often used for cleaning uh, the specimen surface. It can also be used uh, for depth pro profiling as well. So we can use the same principle. So let's say we clean the surface with the ion gun, remove the top layer, and then we perform XPS or AES uh, spectrum. We get those results from that clean surface. Well, if we want to look further into the material, we can use the ion gun in the same way. We can uh, apply the ions again, um, sputter away uh, these materials, and look a little further into the material. And so that's what we know, uh, know as depth profiling. So even though it's a surface sensitive technique, we can get uh, layer, uh, layers further into the material by removing surface layers. And so that's another, uh, another reason we can use the ion gun in this uh, sample. All right, so now let's get to how the electron's kinetic energy is actually analyzed. And uh, a common way to do that is through this uh, concentric hemispherical analyzer, or CHA for, for short. Um, and so it is, as it sounds, uh, composed of two concentric hemispheres. And uh, we apply negative potentials to both. Um, and so essentially we have an uh, inlet, which is from the specimen, an outlet which goes to our detector. And the idea behind this is that we set the voltages, uh, one and two here, uh, of these hemispheres uh, such that only electrons of a specific energy can pass through the channel. So we basically set it up in such a way that we select only a certain type of electron to, to come through. So before we get to that uh, CHA, um, the electron energy is actually reduced with what we call an electrostatic transfer lens. And so you can see that uh, here. So this is um, the specimen, uh, then uh, we have the, the transfer lenses here. Um, so for XPS, uh, we have a level of what we'd call electron retardation. So again, we're trying to reduce the energy here. And uh, we maintain that at what we call a consistent pass energy. So this is constant analyzer energy mode. So we, um, we maintain the same level of retardation um, there. For um, AES, the ratio of that electron retardation is maintained um, as a constant and the pass energy is changed. And that's known as constant retardation, retarding uh, ratio or CRR. So basically, I don't want to get into the, the, the details here. Uh, this isn't super important for the overall basics of XPS and AES, um, but basically um, there would be different modes for these transfer lenses um, either CAE or CRR, 
uh, for the different types. And it basically has to do with what we need for the um, CHA, the, the hemispherical analyzer that we saw here.